All right, we're going to start looking at integer operations. Just so you know, in terms of our elementary curriculum, students learn about integers in about sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. That is where that really starts to hit hard. And I need you to be aware of something before we even start getting into how students learn about integer operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And that is this. Historically, the whole notion of negative, the whole notion of zero, in fact, historically was not something that was just easily received, easily conceived of, easily demonstrated. And so what I'd like to show, with, uh, show you is from a 2010 study. I want to show you when students were confronted with the idea of negative quantities, what were the conceptual challenges that, that, that they were presented with? What kind of thinking did we see from students? And then I want to compare that to just history. Historically, mathematicians, some of which you'll recognize the names, I hope, maybe not all, but historically, mathematicians had the same response as our students. They're just paralleling the development, the historical development of an important idea called integers. Check this out. All right, first of all, the conceptual challenge is this. Negative numbers maybe first arise when students have to take something from nothing. For example, three minus five. Can you imagine going back to our idea of subtraction as takeaway, which is a pretty firmly rooted understanding for kids, take away. So if you have three something and you take away five, how does that make sense to a kid? Kid says in this study, three minus five doesn't even make sense because three is less than five. How do you take five away from three? Another student says three minus five is zero. Because if you have three, you can't take away five. So you take away the three and it leaves you with zero. Like three minus five just means take away as much as you can. And if it was more than that, well, then you just have zero and there's nothing beyond that. And then zero is nothing, but negative is more nothing. <laughs> the, the idea of moving into the realm of conceiving of a negative quantity is really challenging. Student says, a number is how you know how much something is. Like, this is two, and he might hold up two blocks, two counter chips or something, and say, look, I have two. Can you likewise hold up something and call it a negative two? That's a hard thing to conceive of. But historically, there's a mathematician named Blaise Pascal, and he says, I know people who cannot understand that when you subtract four from zero, what is left is zero. Now, maybe this name doesn't uh, ring a bell for you, but Blaise Pascal historically is a, um, a well-known mathematician, philosopher, and for him to have this struggle, look, subtract four from zero. That means zero minus four. And Blaise Pascal is like, no, you can't even do that. What's left is zero. Rene Descartes. Maybe that name rings a bell. He's famous for saying, I think, therefore I am. Uh, Rene Descartes. Negative roots, like in a, in a solution to a problem, if there were negative solutions, they were rejected as false because they claimed to represent something less than nothing. How can you have something that's less than nothing? The negative quantity. All right, so there's the first little flow of this. There's a couple more of these. Conceptual challenges, a lack of a tangible, concrete, or realistic interpretation for negative numbers. See, with kids in elementary school, we can count things. We can pull out M&Ms or gummy bears or something and count how many there are, and it's a tangible, concrete, realistic thing to count, a quantity to count. How do you have that with negative numbers? How do you have less than zero? That's a tough thing. So a student in this study says, negative numbers aren't really numbers because we don't really count with them in school. And there's no negative one cube. So they have unifix cubes. I don't know if you remember this from your elementary days of like interlocking cubes. So the student holds up a cube and goes, that's one. There's no cube that represents negative one. So that's a challenge. Or students were confronted with things like this. Three minus five equals blank. Lacey, learning about integers, answers correctly that 3 minus 5 is negative 2. 
And what Lacey says is, the number line helped me a lot. And the interviewer says, well, what about the cubes? How do they help you? And Lacey says, now, when I use cubes, I mean, what could they help me with? How am I going to do it? So as you've seen in this class, we've used base 10 blocks and other manipulatives to help to make sense. And when we get into the integers, it's just conceptually more challenging, although we're going to do it. You'll see. Mathematicians, likewise, there's an Indian mathematician named Bhaskara, Expl Bhaskara I, explain that people do not approve of negative absolute number, thus negative solutions were incongruous, just impossible. Or Fibonacci, maybe you've heard of the Fibonacci series, Chouquet, and then Rene Descartes again, they did not accept negative solutions unless the result could be interpreted as something positive. For example, you might think of negatives in your world as where you come from is if your bank account is is overdrawn we have a negative quantity but they would just argue well it's not that it's really a negative quantity it's just a quantity classified as an amount you owe versus a quantity uh interpreted as amount you have so you could still say ten dollars but owing it versus having it and so to Fibonacci, Chuke, and Descartes wouldn't really call that a negative. They would just call that as a $10 owed, for example. It's just a conceptual challenge. All right, another one. Counterintuitive situations involving routine interpretations of addition and subtraction. Routine interpretation. So addition, combining quantities. Subtraction, separating or removing quantities. Student, 4 plus blank equals 3. Maybe you know 4 plus negative 1 equals 3, but a student says it's not a real problem. It's not true. He crosses out the problem and says, you made a mistake. It's supposed to say 4 minus 1 equals 3. See, it's when you have a conception of addition as being combining quantities, it's really challenging to understand how negative works. And so this student just said, I'm going to change the problem to make sense of it for myself and make it a four minus one. Another student, in response to the problem, six plus blank equals four. Now you might know six plus negative two equals four. But a student says, hey, what's that plus sign for? Isn't it supposed to be a minus? Six minus two equals four? <laughs> now, you might know, given your experiences, that, that we can conceive of this now, but conceptually, it's a challenge for kids learning for the first time. When they see something like six, you have six of something, and if you add on to it, how could you get less? It doesn't make sense. Diophantus, famous mathematician, claimed that the equation 4 equals 4x plus 20 was absurd. Now, just take a minute and make sense of this equation. 4 times an unknown quantity, so 4 times something, and then you're going to add 20. You're going to add 20 and get 4. How could that be? How could you add 20 to an unknown quantity and get 4? Theophantus, famous mathematician, says that's absurd because the 4 was less than the 20 units that were added. Now, we might know now, you might think of this as 4 times negative 6 is negative 24. And negative 24 plus 20. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. I did that wrong right there, too. 4 times negative 4 is negative 16, and negative 16 plus 20 is 4. And so uh, we know we can solve this equation, but historically it was not thought about to have a negative quantity to add 20 and get something less than 20 was absurd. All right, so that's where we're at. And so I, I raised this issue in this video just to make you alert that as you're learning, and you're thinking about struggle, you might be struggling, students might be struggling, but it's okay. Productive struggle is part of learning, and when you have to productively struggle about a conceptually challenging issue like negative numbers, just know that historically we, we see, and it kind of in parallel, imagine the, the history of the development of negative numbers and the history of your students learning about negative numbers it's going to kind of run in parallel, and we have to overcome those challenges with experiences and thinking and reasoning and the standards for mathematical practices to get us thinking. 
But that's what's exciting. That's what's exciting is that we get to, as human beings, really think about these things, not as a trivial pursuit exercise, but as an intellectual um, endeavor to make sense, to understand, to think, to reason. That, in the end, is going to be beneficial for our students.